Good evening. I'm Tiziana Tedesco, Deputy Director at the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario, Canada. And on behalf of our Board of Directors and all my colleagues, I would like to welcome you to this first masterclass of a series of three, where we will discover indigenous grape varieties that make Italy's wine production unique and of the highest quality. This event is part of the True Italian Taste Project which is promoted and financed by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, and which includes tasting events, masterclasses, cooking classes, and focused events for media, influencers, and industry representatives, all featuring authentic Italian food and wines and certified products. For this great Italian wine series, we have collaborated with Cavinona, Ronnie's exclusive wine agency, which we thank for their assistance and enthusiasm. And we're happy to welcome Sandra Colosimo, certified sommelier with the renowned Italian Association of Sommelier, who has brought her expertise to Cavinona. Tonight, Sandra will guide us through understanding noble Nebbiolo and Valpolicella varieties, which will be paired with delicious, authentic Italian DOP products. Enjoy the evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, it has just been wonderful in these challenging times to be able to connect with some of you who've reached out. And uh, so it's just nice to spend an hour together and um, just sit back, relax, and enjoy. So uh, just to get started, um, you can start with the slides. I want to talk a little bit, give you a little bit of a background in terms of Italy. And Italy it has the world's um, richest uh, variety of indigenous grapes. Um, it is, uh, Italy is the world's largest wine producer and exporter by volume. Um, it is also then followed by France and Spain. So uh, in 2019, 50 million hectoliters were produced. Um, but basically, to put it in perspective, uh, Italy uh, produces 20% of the global production. So I think we all know that we enjoy Italian wines, but I thought the, 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 the numbers or stats could put a, a bit of a perspective. So it is a very important um, uh, uh, producer in, in terms of wine. Also, Italy's export market is very significant, and over 40% of their production is exported. So that's uh, quite a significant number, or 6.4 um, billion euro in 2019. Um, so how does that all relate to Canada? Well, I think we all know what the answer is. We love Italian wine, um, and we Canada does rank as in the top five in terms of export destinations for the Italian export market. So uh, very important indeed. And so there has been also an increase in the last few years. So we look forward to increasing that trend. And we're just very happy to bring some special, um, authentic uh, wines from Italy. Um, and just and so we just look forward to uh, exploring these further tonight. Okay. So not only is Italy the uh, largest producer and exporter of wine, it has the greatest number of indigenous grape varieties. So we can do many, many classes. Uh, there's 2,000 registered and approximately um, three to 400 are actively being used. So Italy is very unique. So it's number one producer, number one export, and we also have uh, the number one in terms of uh, number of indigenous grape varieties. So it's quite a wealth. Um, um, to, to, to go through. So we have lots of classes that we can do. Um, Italy is also very unique. As you know, there's 20 regions. Um, and unlike any other country, every single region has its own wine producing area. And so with that, of course, there's, you can imagine, um, many indigenous varieties. And just like the cuisine varies from one region to another or the dialect uh, varies from one city to another city in the same region. It's the same thing with wine and wine style, uh, the culture, the landscape, the tradition, they all play uh, major influences. 
Okay, so quickly we'll just uh, go over, we get a lot of questions in regards to the classification and we, I'm sure we're all very familiar about the DOC and the DOCG, but just quickly we just wanted to go through that. Um, so basically the classification system that uh, was done in the 1960s, uh, basically in response to Francis uh, AOC uh, um, uh, quality system or classification system. So basically there are four tiers. Um, on the top, you have the DOCG, and that basically stands for denomination um, of origin, controlled, and guaranteed. So basically, um, the, the system is set up as a protection to guarantee um, the origin of the product, the quality of the product. And so basically, a disciplinata is set. And so it's basically a set of rules and regulations that dictate things like uh, grape yields, um, uh, density in the vineyards, production methods, and also uh, dictates which uh, percentages, and we'll see that, percentages of different varieties. So um, we'll have a look at that. And so that's the DOCG. Um, the first DOCG um, was given in uh, 1980. And then we go down to the DOC, and uh, that's, a uh, again, a denomination of uh, controlled origin. Um, again, it's uh, to ensure to the, um, to the consumer that you're getting a wine in this case, and also the same thing with food, and we'll talk about that, that it's coming, that it is the real thing, basically. Um, so if you think many years ago when there was a much more open market, um, you know, just not sure where things were produced or where they were produced from either different regions, um, it's the same thing with olive oil. For example, you buy olive oil, but you're not sure where the olives are coming from. So this is set up as a classification to protect and guarantee uh, the product. So it ultimately um, ensures uh, you're getting what you think you're getting uh, in terms of quality. And then you have IGT, and which is indi uh, indication of the geographic typicity. So again, that's set up, uh, that's just based on um, the geographics, um, there's a little bit more freedom in this one. So uh, once the DOCs and the docs were set up, they had the IGT so that um, until uh, also today, a lot of winemakers and some other wines will put in an IGT because that gives them a little bit more flexibility. Um, so if they want to use a variety that in certain wines, um, is not allowed, then they can do that. So, um, so basically, it is a tier system. Um, it's a control, it's a guarantee, um, but there are exceptions in terms of does it mean that one is higher than the other sometimes. Um, and producers, winemakers, even very important winemakers, have made choices to sometimes declassify from a DOCG to a DOC because they want to incorporate uh, different varieties. So if, instead of 100%, they want to incorporate two types of varieties, so they'll do that. Um, so then uh, in Europe, they um, in 2010, um, they came up with uh, the DOP, which basically uh, groups together your DOC and your DOCG, and then your IGP, and then there's uh, and you know that tabula, that's the last at the bottom. You don't see as much of that anymore. Um, so DOP is very important to mention because um, that's, again, uh, also on your food products. And so it's a protection and guarantee, and it ensures products are locally produced and packaged um, and set according to standards. So uh, especially with Italian products and like, you know, other um, countries, it, you know, the certain words are used to market and promote, but it's not the real thing. So if it's a DOP, it's the real thing. It's telling you it's a protected designation of that origin. So if you want the Parmigiano, then Giano DOP, um, not just a neutral uh, Parmigiano uh, label. Okay, so the tray that you received, for those of you who ordered uh, the, uh, the, the Antipasto Mezzo Mezzo by uh, Spaccio at Terroni, um, again, as well, uh, DOP products are very important to us. And you have some Grana Padano. It's all about authenticity and excellence. So um, we'll get to get some prosciutto and we'll get to that. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so what's unique about Italy? So the question is, is uh, we're number one producers, number one exporters. We have all these varieties. So why is that? What, 
what does Italy have that's so special? We all know that we love Italy and Italy is beautiful. And this is just another important asset, um, an important commercial one as well. So uh, Italy has endless opportunities to produce good wine. Um, there's a complexity of factors that goes into producing good wine. And Italy has an abundance of, of as I said, the varieties, uh, like we said, three to 400 varieties that are active, rich soils, the history and the geology of Italy that goes back to ancient times and, and before. Um, we have a real wide mix of soils uh, from north to south, uh, which we'll look at that a little bit more. The altitude. Altitude promotes um, excellent uh, wine growth and, and grape development. So we have a lot of hills and mountains, mild temperatures, sun exposure. Um, so, and we also have the benefit of the, the Alps and other mountain ranges. And those are also important factors in protecting vineyards in certain areas. So Italy does have uh, a wealth of positive factors that promote good winemaking or good grape growing. Um, okay, so we can go to the next. Ah, so here we are. So uh, we're going to take a little bit of a tour. We're going to distract from everything else that's happening in the world. Um, and we wish very much that, now doesn't that look lovely? <laughs> Um, I know we're all just itching to travel and wherever that may be. So here we're in uh, Piemonte. And so we're talking about the Noble Nebbiolo. And Piemonte um, is the home of Nebbiolo. And Piemonte basically means at the foot of the mountain. And so basically that image was there. You could see the Alps. So literally we're at the foot of the Alps. Um, so we're going to talk about sort of this region and, um, and basically the characteristics. So Nebbiolo lives almost exclusively in Italy. So it's unlike several other type of international grapes. So that's what's very special about Nebbiolo. Um, there's certain pockets, and we'll talk about that. The majority of it is in Piemonte, and it's concentrated in the Lange area. Um, and then there are also uh, other pockets, which we'll mention in two other regions. But Nebbiolo, unlike uh, any other grape, it is very, um, it likes its home. Um, there's a long, long history. Um, it's finicky, it's fussy. We'll talk about that. But this is where, uh, this is the home of Barolo and Barbaresco, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, Okay, so basically, uh, there's evidence, or if you can just go back, thank you. There's evidence, this is one, thank you. Um, so we're going right back to the Roman age. Uh, the Nibiola was documented as Nubiola um, by the Roman author Pliny the Elder. So I put those, that information in because it puts a perspective on, we're talking about a variety, you know, from the Roman times. I'm sure, you know, some, a lot of evolution and changes, but that's why it is such a noble um, variety. So since the 1200s, there's documentation that's actually been referred to as Nebbiolo. Okay, so basically, as I mentioned, we're in the Northwest, if I did, uh, Northwest part of Italy in Piemonte. The mountains, um, you have our protect the area on, um, from the north, uh, you have the Po River. Um, uh, Nebbiolo is undoubtedly one of the most prized grape varieties in Italy uh, viticulture. Um, and like I said, it produces the iconic um, wines of Barolo and Barbaresco and much more. And this is what we're gonna talk about. Okay, so interesting, and we'll just quickly go through this, 1402 in the town of La, Mor La Morra, which is in the Lange, which is a major uh, Barolo producing area. So in 1402, a law was passed that um, they were giving stiff penalties uh, for anybody caught uh, cutting down the Nebbiolo vines. So that shows you just um, how important and how noble. Uh, so from the 1400s. Uh, then in the 1800s, we have the Count of Cavour, and he was the first uh, prime minister after the unification of Italy. 
And it's quite interesting. He, he was not happy. The wine was uh, sweet and fruity at the time. And um, he wasn't happy with it. And there's documentation about it. And so he actually, um, I don't remember the name, but he did invite someone from France, um, an enologist, to, to, to work on. So was, he really uh, changed things around for the uh, Nebbiolo wine. And then in 1926, uh, the Consortium for the Defense of Barolo and Barbaresco Wines um, was established. So a very significant history. Okay, so let's let's move on. Okay, so Nebbiolo. What do we know about Nebbiolo? Okay, well, we know it is one of the most distinguished and noblest uh, grape varieties that we have. The color is blue-black. It's a medium-sized um, grape size. Now, uh, it is one of the earliest to bud and one of the latest to harvest. Now, why is that important? We'll talk about it in a second. It is, like I mentioned, a uh, very uh, finicky and uh, fussy variety. It does need good sun exposure to help achieve the ripeness. So, um, so here we are in Piemonte. Um, the weather is uh, dry, uh, could be a bit cool. So if it is a late harvest grape, it's important that it has for the best development of the grapes, you want it in an area that you're getting good sun exposure. Because if it's a late harvest, that's like end of October, uh, early November. And so if you don't have altitude and you have the right exposure which um which is usually be, be like a, a southern exposure to get the most sun exposure um so the the key um maybe all of the concentrated cradle of maybe all the growth in the uh, lange uh, roero uh, monferrato area a lot of the key or more important oldest vineyards, um, oftentimes they have a southern exposure. Um, so it needs a dry climate. Um, also, you need to be careful. It is one of the earliest varieties to bud. So being up in northern, um, northwest Italy, you have to be careful with any early frost. So that could be very damaging on the, on the vines. Um, it prefers calcareous marl and, like I said, high altitude. So what's interesting to know is that um, Nebbiolo, uh, they've tried their small places a little bit in the, in the U.S., maybe in Argentina. But basically, Nebbiolo, it's been unsuccessful outside of Italy. And to think that the majority is all, there's different pockets in Galura, um, down south, uh, but basically the majority of the Nebbiolo produced is in uh, the Northwest Territory of Italy. Okay, so Nebbiolo is thought to come from the word, okay, yeah, that's good because I just want to mention that. They, it's thought to come from the word, uh, yeah, if you can just go back to the grapes for a second, thanks. Um, it's thought to come from the word Nebbia or fog. That's one of the hypotheses is because of if you think of those pictures of Piemonte in fall during harvest time, um, you've got uh, fog sitting in, you've got a blanket over the valleys and vineyards. So nebbia, which means fog, that's what I think is uh, one reason for the name. The other suggestion is if you take a look at this picture, that's the uh, nebbiolo grape. Um, the nebbiolo grape has pruina, this um, white coating or bloom. Um, on the grapes, there's this characteristic, which you find on different fruit. Um, so they say maybe that's also another reason for the nebbia. So that's um, just uh, just a little curiosity. Um, okay, so we said that it is late maturing and needs a lot of sunlight. It is finicky and fussy and uh, very um, sensitive to the soils. And that's why it lives very well where it is. Um, so the vineyards are, are concentrated in the Lange area, and actually today, this evening, we'll get to it very shortly, are the wine that we'll be tasting 
is not, we're not at the barola, but it's, it's a wonderful, and this is what we're talking about. This wine, which we'll get to, is 100% Nebbiolo. So this is a Languedoc Nebbiolo. If you consider, and we'll look at it very quickly, a Barolo is 100% uh, Nebbiolo. A Barbaresco is 100% Nebbiolo. The Lange Nebbiolo Doc is 100% Nebbiolo. So what's the difference? So there's a, there is, of course, differences, and that's what we'll talk about. But the variety and the percentage is all the same. So that's what makes winemaking so fascinating. Okay. So um, Nebbiolo is the most terroir expressive red grape in Italy. Um, and what that means is that terroir is not the territory, but much more. It's the climate, it's the soil, it's the landscape. And we'll look at some of these things that affect the expression of the Nebbiolo. So we'll be concentrating on the uh, heartland of Nebbiolo and the Lange, but I will be mentioning other areas. There's Roero, which changes a little bit the expression. There's um, Val de Osta, there's La Telina. Um, and that is, so the Nebbiolo, it, 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 there is, of course, a fil rouge um, between all of them, but um, they do express the territory, so there are some differences. Okay. Um, the characteristics. Okay. So... Um, one thing to, the first thing is we'll look at the color um, and then we'll get to the comparisons. And if you have your glass, take a look at, um, if, for those of you who bought the wines, but if you haven't, maybe you can see something here. The Nebbiolo is a light pigment. It's light ruby red. You will rarely see um, a Nebbiolo that has a violet hues that's opaque. Um, you can see, and we'll get to it when we do the wine tasting, um, but for those of you who have purchased the wines, you can see that the uh, Lange Nebbiolo Doc, there's a transparency to it, and you can see it's a light, slight ruby red, and it's also very characteristic um, that there's an orange uh, tinge or nuance, especially if you look at the edge of the glass, and oftentimes, that sort of coloration in wines, you, you'll see that in wines that are aged because wines, as they age, they lose color and they go from a dark red or red to, to orange. That's in the normal. But in the Nebbiolo, that doesn't mean that it is prematurely aged. That is just the characteristic of the wine. So um, you can just see, I don't know if you can see it here on the screen, but at home, you can see the Valpolicella is darker and richer and the Nebbiolo, and that's just a carry, that's in the DNA of the variety. Okay, so um, we'll get to the wine tasting, but the scents, um, fresh fruit, cherry, plum, rose, um, violet, um, then depending on uh, the aging, leather, licorice, there, um, but the classic is also, you can um, smell tar and roses. That's very characteristic of Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo, what do we know about Nebbiolo? It's high acidity, strong tannins. Um, so uh, that those two are, is, is key. Nebbiolo is a tannic variety, and we'll get to that. So um, the acidity, the tannins, they give you body and structure and age worthy. Hence, the Barolos and the Barbarescos that you can age for years, years on end. If you don't have the tannins, it is very difficult to have the structure and complexity. So let's uh, move on to the, the next slide. Okay, Nebbiolo, the vineyards, where? Okay, we're just gonna go through, I think I've mentioned this already. Um, so the Lange, um, and um, let me see if there's a, ah, the Lange, and along with Roero and Monferrato have been declared uh, UNESCO. Um, so this is a beautiful location if you haven't been there. Endless medieval uh, towns and castles and um, lots of good wine and wineries and wonderful food. So definitely a wonderful place to visit. We're near the town of Alba. That's very important for those of you at uh, Tartufo. I encourage you to go during that uh, Tartufo season, um, they're famous for their white Tartufo. Um, 
So it's a, it's a wonderful, magical place. Okay, so like I said, the wines are highly acclaimed, are uh, Barolo, DOCG, and Barbaresco, which are the king and queen of Italian wines. Okay, so um, Barolo is, again, 100% Nebbiolo, the soil, calcareous marl, um, a marine origin, so by regulation, the aging is three years, two of which have to be in oak um, or chestnut barrels. The reserva is a minimum of five years. The minimum alcohol content is 13%. Um, so with the Barola, some of these vines are like 50 or 60 years old. So uh, we're, we'll get to the Odero, but uh, this comes from a very important historical um, winery. Okay, so... Barolo, next slide. Um, okay, so the vina, if there's vina indicated, it's on the, it's the, it's indicating the vineyard or the crew that's become increasingly um, used more and more in the Barolo region. Just to mention, I don't, we're not going to go into it right now, but again, uh, there's 11 communes all situated in the Lange Hill. The five most important are uh, Barolo, La Morra, um, remember that, and when we try the wine, the Castiglione Falletto, Serra Lunga d'Alba, and Monforte d'Alba. We won't get into it right now, but even in that area, it is divided uh, between the eastern, the western and the eastern side, and the differences in soil, which um, on the more western side, you have Serra Lunga d'Alba, for example, which because of the soils, it gives even more structure and harder on the um, some more structured wines, uh, more powerful wines. And then maybe um, in Castiglione Falletto, you have more uh, perfume um, um, and maybe just not as uh, strong in terms of tannins. But basically, there are variations. So the Barolas are muscular, powerful, intense tannins. Um, there's acidity, and as I said, they're age-worthy. You can wait, uh, age them for years. Um, okay, so we're just going to move along. And Barbaresco. Barbaresco is always considered so there was a masculine and the feminine side, uh, the, the queen of wine. Again, 100% Nebbiolo. So we're always talking about 100% Nebbiolo in these cases. There's also Nebbiolos that are done in blends. Um, and so there are uh, four major areas that are important. The minimum aging here is two years, uh, one of which is in a cask. Uh, again, well-structured, aromatic, lighter in body, um, slightly you know, mid-palate, less tannic. Uh, so again, it's a little bit, uh, we shouldn't say maybe a little bit more on the feminine, they say in the masculine. Um, same soil composition, but sandier. Uh, it's a wine that's elegant and with a lot of finesse. Okay. This is just a very quick map just to show you um, a little bit the different communes um, and the locations where they are. Uh, Barolo and La Mora, and then you have Barbaresco. Um, again, we're on the right bank of the river, um, just on the other side from Barbaresco, you've got Roero, which has more sandy soils, which produce some wonderful um, Nebbiolo wines. A perspective. Okay. Next. Okay. So just very quickly, um, I just want to mention that there's a few other uh, areas that produce some wonderful expressions of Nebbiolo. Um, so northwest Piemonte, so we're going north Piemonte, so the Lange is south Piemonte, we we'll go north. On the northwest, we've got Carema Dock. Um, again, different expression, Nebbiolo, um, a wonderful winemaking area. It's up in the hills and the mountains where they have natural stone terraces, um, a heroic uh, viticulture. Um, you can't get there by machines. And um, it's just a, a wonderful expression of Nebbiolo. And then if you haven't tried as well, Alto Piemonte Northeast. And so you have uh, some wonderful expressions there. I just wanted to mention 
just put them on the radar, Gatinara, VOCG, GEN, Boca, Lesona, those are all very important areas. Oh, and I also want to mention that the name Nebbiolo changes. That's just a diet, that's just a regional thing. It's still Nebbiolo. Um, but for example, in Alto Piemonte on the northeast side is called Spana. Okay, you can go to the next one. So we, that's just an example of where we are in Gatinara. That's you can see the Alps. Um, and then we've got uh, Lombardia, uh, the Vatellina. So again, we're at the foot of the Alps. Um, in the region uh, just east of Piemonte, and those are just some some sub varieties. So you can see it's just endless, um, just in terms of learning and trying and finding. There's a style of wine for everybody. Uh, what one may like, the other one does. You know, it's just important to try them out and just find what you like. And so the Nebbiolo there is called Cavernasca, and then also uh, very interesting is. Um, the Sforzato di Vastellina, which is made with dried Nebbiolo. So it's the same style as Amarone, but with uh, dried Nebbiolo grapes. So I just wanted to mention that. And then next. And then we go uh, Valle d'Aosta, which is the smallest region in Italy, um, just north of um, Piemonte. And there the Nebbiolo is called uh, Picotendro or Picotener. Um, and it's grown in the Donas region, right near the border of Carema. And uh, it's just another wonderful um, Nebbiolo uh, producing area. Great structure. It's just an alpine expression of the Nebbiolo. Okay, so that's a quick summary as to the characteristics of the wine, um, where they're produced, and now we can get to the wine tasting. Okay, so. Um, I poured a little bit extra here so that you can see the color, hopefully, on the monitor. Again, if you have a white piece of paper, it would be very interesting to, that's where you can best see the core of the color of the wine and towards the edge of the wine. Um, if you put a white paper underneath, um, you can really see the difference between, say, we haven't talked about the Vapolicella, which is darker and deeper, but if we look at the Nebbiolo, it's transparent um, and it has a slight orange tinge. So we're, I'm just very happy to, um, we're very happy to, to uh, present Odero. Um, it's a real jewel in the Lange area. The wines of Odero are uh, appreciated all over the world. Um, and we're just really proud to be able to uh, have the Odero wines here in Ontario and have them part of our Carvinona and Tedoni family. It is a historic producer. Um, Odero's foundation is about uh, family tradition um, and passion for the land with a lot of this. It goes back to um, the roots, of the, the, they go back to the 18th century. So they've been around for a few years. Uh, maybe about 300 years. So there's a lot of history and experience there. Um, just think, you know, it's just, we're talking about hundreds of years. Um, and it's a very interesting history. Odero was among the first to bottle um, in 1878, um, when at the time uh, it was still common to use Damajan, uh, Damajani. Um, so it is one of the oldest Barolo wineries um, and they own some of the most um, important uh, crew of Barolo and Barbaresco vineyards. And so it is wonderful to be able to, um, to as introduce Nebbiolo with this Lange Nebbiolo dock. This is a tw uh, 2018 um, alcohol content Fourteen uh, percent. Um, the what I just want to say the history of the winery. Uh, Giacomo Odero was uh, the a key uh, person uh, who who made a difference in 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 the acquisition of different vineyards, and, and he was born in 1926. But basically, um, he was the grandson of the first Giacomo of the family. Uh, his legacy is carried out today by Maria Cristina, his daughter, and the two grandchildren, Isabella and Pietro. So again, we're talking about seventh generation, 
We're talking about family. We're talking about tradition um, and just great winemaking. So they've got the wonderful vineyards, history, uh, location, and lots of care and passion. Okay, so the, this winery is located in Santa Maria, uh, La Morra, that overlooks uh, the hills of um, Lelangen. Okay, so also they also, like I said, they have some key um, um, vineyards to to check out um, and their Barolos for their cruise. And they have a wonderful Barbaresco um, in um, Galina, uh, which is a wonderful crew. Okay, so um, let's see here what. Okay, so let's go. Let's try, so let's look at the, let's do the, start with the visual examination. So like I said, the color, it's light, it's not gonna be dark. It's a beautiful transparency. Um, and it's just, it's just a beautiful representation of Nebbiolo. Okay, so let's do the olfactory. And so what do you, what do you get from that? You get a lot of, uh, Fresh fruit, cherry, some violets, perhaps, maybe a little bit of balsamic, okay, so let's let's try it. Mm. Okay, so if you feel a little bit of the tingle, you can taste, you can feel a little bit of the, of the tannins. Um, there's a wonderful uh, bit of um, snappiness to it. Um, the tannins are not too aggressive and that's what I would expect because um, the Odero is aged in uh, large wooden casks for a year and a half. So um, it's not going, it's not uh, too many years. We're not talking about three years or what have you. So the tannins, um, they're, they're, you can you taste them, but they're delicate. It's pleasant. Um, it's persistent, it coats the mouth, has a wonderful presence in the mouth. Um, it's just crunchy, it's red fruit, violets. Um, it's just very nice and smooth and it does have a nice presence on the tongue, it coats your mouth nicely and just you could feel it, it has that nice tingle. And um, it is approachable, uh, it's versatile, and it goes wonderful with cured meat and, and cheese, just like from your antipasto plate with prosciutto crudo. It also goes nicely with pasta, with uh, risotto, risotto con uh, tartufo d'alba, for example. Um, nothing too, too, too complex, but uh, some good protein as well. Anything when you have tannins, it's good with some protein. Um, so I hope you've uh, you've enjoyed that. Um, so we'll move on to let's go through the Vapolicella because I'm sure we're time is running. So uh, let's go to the next slides. So basically, uh, we are going from. Uh, Piemonte, we're north to from Piemonte to Vapolicella. So, so two very essential regions in northern Italy and in wine producing. Um, Vapolicella is known as La Perla di Verona because in Vapolicella, we are about just it's just north of Vapolicella area, it's just north of Verona. Um, and it, Vapolicella is also called the Valley of Many Cellars. Again, another area which dates back to prehistoric and Roman times um, with their vino retico, which is um, a, 
wheat, wine, and that's where it all started. That's in the, uh, has been documented. Um, it's about 25 kilometers from east to west. Um, you've got the Lassini Mountains on the north and east, and you've got Lake Garda to the west, and that's very important because you've got mountains to protect from the winter uh, cold winds. Uh, so it protects the vineyards, and you've got Lake Garda, which is the biggest lake in Italy, and water areas help mitigate the temperature. So you've got Lake Garda to your, uh, on the west. Okay, so there's a mix of, again, um, Valpolicella is a fantastic area. Uh, when you think of Valpolicella, it's diversity. Diversity in the varieties, uh, big diversity in um, their soil and their wine styles. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so Valpolicella, the land of also Amadone, um, it's made with uh, the following indigenous varieties. So you have Corvina. So uh, with the disciplinary, it's Corvina, 45 to 95%. Corvinone, maximum 50%. Rondinella, 5 to 30%. And then local varieties, um, maximum of 25%. So it's Corvina, Corvinone, and Rondinella. Those are the three essentials to making Valpolicella or Valpolicella Superiore or Amerone. Um, okay, so let's look at what these varieties look like. Next slide. Okay, Corvina Little Raven, uh, that's, a, that's a translation. Uh, Corvina is the main variety, let's just say the most important variety. It goes back, documentation dates back to the 18th century, but probably goes way back. Um, the majority of the Corvina grows in this area, a very small percentage out of this area in Australia and Argentina. Just to sort of give you a perspective as to all these varieties and their, how they're specific to their, that territory. Okay, so then from Corvina, we have Corvinone. Corvinone, uh, the name, they used to, they thought it was um, uh, just a, a clone of Corvina, so they called it Big Corvina, Corvinone. Um, uh, but that's not the case. So evidence in 1993 or tests showed that it is its own distinct grape. Okay, so um, basically, n not to go into too much of the detail, but it's here to show you that it is a blend um, and the role of each variety. And so the Corvina is a thick skin grape. So that's important because it's a good for drying. And for drying, that's good for the Amarone. Um, it's a light colored wine on its own, the Corvina. Um, distinct cherry flavor, violet, uh, low tannins, high acidity. The Corvinone instead gives it some meat and structure. Uh, so basically that's just to show the difference, uh, the importance of all the different varieties. Rondinella is the aromatic, is the, the, the perfume. It's a high sugar content, which is also good for drying and also good for Amarone. Okay, so moving right along, uh, the wines of uh, Policella. Okay, so they're basically four different styles from sort of a lighter body to fuller body to richer. Um, so we'll start with the Valpolicella DOC. Um, so again, by law, the grapes are cultivated 100% in Valpolicella, uh, the production of bottling um, same thing in the Verona area. Now the alcohol content, here we are, we got something more of a lighter body, minimum 11% volume. It's a fresh, fruity, lively wine, light profile, versatile, great to have every day. Um, light meals, maybe with some light pasta or light meat dishes, nothing too heavy because it is a lighter structured kind of wine. Uh, pizza, uh, so it's very approachable kind of wine, very versatile. Um, pleasurable. Okay, so next we go to Valpolicella DOC, uh, Superiore, Superior. So uh, same grapes, same varieties, same percentages. Again, there is that leeway, so every winemaker can work within um, those criteria. Now, these wines um, have increased intensity and complexity. The, um, the aromas and flavors are of uh, riper cherry, sweet and uh, spice aromas and darker fruit. 
uh, the superior DOC must do a minimum of a year in wood from the first uh, ja from January after the vintage, and, and this has a minimum of 12% alcohol, so uh, minimum. So it's usually higher than that, and so today we'll be uh, trying the Valpolicella Superiore, um, which does more than one year, but does three of uh, aging. Okay, so then we go to the third type of style. So we all probably hear the Valpolicella di Passo, DOC. Um, what is a di Passo? Again, the same mix of the indigenous grapes that we mentioned, Corvina, Corvinone, Rondinella, and then a small mix depending on the producer. So the di Passo basically means repass over over again. So basically, how is it made? They make the Valpolicella base, uh, like a regular Valpolicella doc wine. Then um, they take the wine after a couple of months and they put it in the same vat that was used to make Amarone. So the dry, so Amarone, which we'll get to next, um, uses dried grapes. So once that vat is emptied out, you've got the leftover pumice or the dried skins and yeast that was used to make Amarone or Rechoso, which is a sweet wine. Um, so the base Val, um, Valpolicella uh, doc goes into those casks and for a second fermentation. So why is that? So that adds color, that adds flavor and texture and consequently has an increased alcohol content. So that's the Di Passo. So you've got more concentration um, and uh, it's a repass and they use those grapes. Then we move on to the famous and very well-known Amarone della Valpolicella, and this is a DOCG. And the Amarone means uh, big bitter, Amaro, bitter, big bitter, um, again, same, so we got different four styles of wine, but we're talking about the same grape varieties, Corvina, Corvinona, Rondinella, by law, then they can mix in a few others. Okay, so um, this is a very special wine, um, and so very, very uh, popular when it first came out to, in the United States and North America. It was very well received, um, and it is one of the most important wines for the Valpolicella area. So the grapes are dried for several months uh, or weeks to months. Um, and they lose their water, basically. They eva evaporate and that concentrates the sugars. The grapes are dried on either bamboo mats or hung. Um, and they must age for, uh, the wine must age for a minimum of two years starting the following year after the vintage. The Reserva is four years. Um, Amarone is a, oops, there's a spelling there, <laughs> mistake. Amarone is a dry wine. Um, sometimes you can think it might could be sweet or uh, might give you that perception, but it is a dry wine, some residual sugar, perhaps. It is a big, bold wine and very high alcohol content. Um, the minimum alcohol content for Amarone is 14%. But for those of you who enjoy your Amarone, you know that it's usually up to 15 and 16%. Um, so again, it's all about the drying of the grapes. And that is an important process because they need a lot of care and attention for that. Um, so they're full-bodied wines, uh, firm tannins. Um, you have richness of uh, ripe fruit. Uh, cherries and alcohol is uh, you can really is a characteristic, and um, some leather notes. Uh, Amarone, because of the structure, because of the complexity, it can age for ten years plus. Again, so with Amarone, it's a fuller, bolder wine. Um, and so you want to pair it with more structured dishes, uh, such as braised uh, meats, uh, very aged cheeses, um, just fuller, long cooked meal with complexity, not a light uh, spaghetti, for example. You want to, you want it to complement. You don't want the meal or the wine one to overbear the other one. Okay, so we're just going to move right along. We've got the Rechotto de la Valpolicella, which is the fourth which is a DOCG. Again, so it's the same varieties, but it's a sweet wine. Uh, it's a pasito style dessert wine from dried grapes. Um, so the 
the grapes are dry for 100 to 200 days, I increase concentration, sugar, and flavor. So the fermentation is stopped before all the sugars are converted to alcohol. So therefore, you have it as a sweet wine. And the ricciotto is where it all began. So it's considered the father of Valpolicella. Okay. So, um, so now we can go to our wine tasting. And we're just really happy to have um, to introduce Piccoli Daniela. Um, it's located in the hills of Monte La Pate, a beautiful hill uh, that overlooks uh, Verona and Valpolicella Panorama. Uh, it's a magical place. The winery is literally situated on a hill and they excavated into the tufa. Uh, they had an old quarry which they um, um, built right into the, the land. Um, and you can actually, the cellar actually, you can have, they have glass where you can actually see the, the rocks um, that they carved into uh, the exca es uh, excavated uh, tough rock through the glass. Uh, it's a niche winery. It's a small wine, very special winery. It's family. It's run by two sisters, um, Alice and Veronica and their parents. Uh, Piccoli, Daniel, Piccoli Daniela is the name and last name of the mother, so of their mother. They produce, they're all about quality, uh, attention to detail. They have about 1,500 hectares um, dedicated to uh, grapes and olives. Um, did you show the picture of the, the, of the uh, winery? I think the slide, it just gives you a uh, perspective. They produce fine and elegant wines. Do you have those? Okay, maybe not. Um, okay, so, so basically I'd just like to talk about, um, introduce to you. We got Vapolicella Superiore Doc. Uh, the name of this one is Roccolo. Uh, it's 7,000, uh, they produce about 7,000 bottles. Um, the harvest is in September. Uh, vinification, uh, about 20 days. Um, and they age in uh, five and three liter barriques um, of French oak for three years. So the minimum here is one year, but they do it for three years. And a few extra months in stainless steel tank and then six months in bottle before it goes out for sale. Uh, we are tasting a 2016, as it takes three to four years before the bottle, uh, the vintage comes out. The alcohol content is 14.5%. Um, it's a beautiful wine. And if we look at the color, it's a beautiful ruby red um, with a slight, uh, some slight purple, and on the nose, so it's about Policella. It's a beautiful uh, aromatic um, floral, um, and and you can taste, you can smell, sorry, a bit of the uh, wood notes. Definitely, it's been three years in the wood. That's something that will you can certainly has more complexity and more of the tertiary notes and that will come through with the aromas and flavors. Eucalyptus. You can also smell the uh, smokiness or and some of the uh, some balsamic notes. It's just a beautiful Okay, wonderful uh, intensity and complexity. So let's do, let's try the, the wine. You can taste the, the body of the wine. You can taste the body of the wine on your tongue, the coating on your tongue, a wonderful presence. This has done three years of wood. You can certainly um, taste some uh, some of the complexity. The, the the fruits, the red fruits, are riper. You can um, some black cherry, some plum. Definitely the spiciness. Um, uh, 
and vanilla. Just the beauty, the persistence um, has a wonderful mouthfeel, a wonderful balance. Um, just a, a beauty, quality product. Uh, that's an important factor when it comes to La Policella and the winemaker. Um, it's certainly, let's just say, not in the uh, mass market kind of wine. This is something that is very specialized and it's all about quality. Um, it's round and it's elegant um, and the persistency. You can also, um, if you look at the consistency on the glass, you can just see the legs. And the arches, you can see the alcohol content, which is 14.5%. This pairs very nicely um, with um, Parmigiana cheese. We have the DOP Gana Padano, uh, the Prosciutto from Giuliano, uh, hard cheeses, uh, Piaven, and um, it's also very, it's a nice regional um, um, combination. So um, again, these are just two beautiful expressions. We basically this evening have what oh, they consider like a baby Barolo, and here we have a baby uh, Amarone. So I hope um, you've enjoyed the overview. Um, Hi, Sandra. Hi. Hi, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I, I just wanted to get to uh, one question. Um, we don't have too sure. much time, so... Um, okay. But I, I, there's one question that I wanted to ask you. First of all, thank you for this wonderful presentation of these two wines. Um, they both look delicious. Unfortunately, I don't have them right here with me, um, but I will try them <laughs> after the class. We'll take care sure. of that. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> same here. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to ask you one question, and I think that's a question that a lot of people ask themselves. So what is the correct serving temperature for red wines? Okay, um, uh, that's a good question. Very quickly, because I know uh, um, the time is limited. So basically, it's just important. If you've got richer wine, uh, this uh, Valpolitea, you got 60, uh, serving temperature would be around 16 to uh, 18 degrees. If you have a lighter uh, body wine, then uh, 12 to 13 degrees, medium body, 14 to 16 degrees. It's just very important to make sure that there, it's not too hot. So you get a soupy wine, you don't want to do that. Um, but it is important to keep an eye on the temperature so that you get the maximum flavors. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm looking well. forward to trying these wines. Um, I would now like to. Um, pass the stage, so to speak, to Ms. Anna Mamoliti, Vice President of Terroni, uh, before we then hear from our uh, Deputy Director, Tiziana Tedesco, uh, for the last few words. Great, thank you so much, Astrid. Um, I just wanna thank on behalf of Terroni and Cavinona Wines, um, Eco Canada for inviting us to be a part of True Italian Taste. Um, I love everything that you guys do to promote Italy. Um, I want to quickly say that um, I feel that a lot of what we do at Terroni and at Cavinona is very similar to your philosophy, and that is bringing the best of the best um, of Italy to, to the Canadian market. And um, it's always wonderful to go through this, for example, this presentation this evening, uh, where we can learn about um, the different grape varieties that uh, that come of it, out of Italy. In fact, um, to find the grapes that we weren't finding in Canada and to, to discover these Indigenous grapes and educate um, the Canadian market um, and, and hence educate our customers, educate our staff first, obviously, to um, then educate the Canadian market. So we are grateful for all the work that you do. I'd like to thank Corrado Paina, who is the director of uh, Eco Canada, to Tiziana Tedesco, the deputy director who spoke earlier, to Astrid for all your collaboration with Sandra um, and making this evening um, such a success, so thank you. And lastly, to our participants, thank you so much. I see that there are over 200 participants, so what a great turnout, thank you. If any of you are interested in any of these wines, um, we're going to post, I think uh, Ilaria will post a discount code for you to um, purchase any of these wines through cavinona.com. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Tiziana. Thank you so much again. 
It was a great presentation. Thank you, Sandra and Cabinona, uh, for this, uh, this uh, wonderful evening. Um, and thank you all, uh, our audience and our media and uh, followers um, that uh, keep following us during our, for our Three Italian Taste program. Uh, uh, next class will be March 11th, and we will feature San Giovese and Vernaccio di San Gimignano, two wonderful wines. So please, Keep following us. We look forward to seeing you there. From Eco Canada, Corrado Paina, our executive director, Astrid, Isabella, Ilaria, and myself. Thank you so much and see you March 11. Cheers, everybody. Grazie mille. Bye bye.